Oh, hello. I have a little demo to start off today's topic of kinetics, and in particular, we're going to look at determining the orders of reaction. This is an old one gallon metal milk jug, and uh, we fitted it, and we went ahead and made this so that it would be an exploding apparatus. We have a candle, and it's gone ahead and uh, been taped to the inside of the container right here, and I'll light that in a few moments. We also went ahead and drilled a hole in this side, put a latex tube and a bulb so that when I go ahead and give the bulb a good squeeze, it forces air into the container right through this little opening. This opening here has a little cup inside of it, and I'm going to put some lycopodium powder. Lycopodium powder is a very, very fine powder. It's the uh, spore from a fern, so it's a natural product, and I'll put a little bit in this cup right here. So when I go ahead and give the bulb a squeeze, the powder is going to make like a powder puff inside this container. Well, if it comes in contact with the candle, this uh, normally not extremely flammable product will become quite flammable because of surface area. We have a dust. This, uh, this is known to people in the Midwest, it poses quite a problem around grain silos because grain silos have a tendency to explode. If there's static charge, lightning, a fire, some type of spark, um, and that's because of surface area. If you've ever gone camping, you know that you're not about to start striking some matches repeatedly underneath a big log. It's not going to go ahead and light that log on fire because of surface area. There's not a lot of exposed surface. But you know that you need kindling or newspaper to get that fire started where it's got lots of surface area compared to the bulk. Now the powder, this little fine powder, has lots and lots of surface area. The surface area here get it to spark on the candle a little bit. Lots of surface area because of the small particle size. Um, the milk jug, which I would never even dream of drinking out of, has a lid, so I'll put the lid on. Ugh. Put on some uh, glasses here for a second and put some air into this thing. Hey, very nice. The uh, candle's still going. The powder inside has uh, combusted. The reaction involved the fuel, which is the powder and oxygen from the atmosphere. It gave a nice little puff. Just recently here, we had a problem in Georgia with a sugar refinery. Some static charge built up in a sugar refinery had a problem because small particle sized sugar particulates in the air caught on fire and made a big puff. Well, let's go ahead and take a look at a uh, kinetics problem, rate of reaction. This one happened quite quickly, involving determining what the order of a reaction is. And I put some experimental data up on the right side here for a, uh, a, a reaction. And we'll talk about what the uh, columns are. We'll talk about what A, B, and the rate are. But first, let's do a very, very trivial exercise called background math. Let's take a look at some exponents. See if we can focus our thinking on what happens when we raise something to the zero power, the first power, and the second power. Now, perhaps in an earlier math class, like in middle school, you learned a nice little rule that anything at all to the zero power is, that's right, Anything to the zero power is one. So I could have two to the zero, I can have seven to the zero, 42 to the zero power, that's going to go ahead and return a one. Also in that class, you probably learned that anything raised to the one power, the first power is itself. So in this case, two to the first would be the number two. The idea there is you've got a two, nothing else. It's not multiplied by anything. If I replace this with a seven, we'd have seven to the first. That would return a seven. Down here, I just want to point out that we will be looking at a squared function. And two squared, of course, is four. That's a nice little background math for us to focus when we take a look at some data. Now, what's happened here in the dust reactor is we have two components at the beginning. We call them reactants. We have the lycopodium powder. We'll call it A. And we have oxygen in the atmosphere. We'll call it B. So the reaction is sum of A reacted with sum of B to produce some products. Let me write a reaction for this. I'm going to write A plus B goes to, and typically we make carbon dioxide and water when we do combustion. So I'm going to call those C plus D. I'm not going to worry about balancing this. We're taking a look at some initial concentrations of A and B. 
I know that I'm speaking in terms of concentrations or moles per liter because we have square brackets. So we have three different experiments to take a look at. EXP for experiment. Experiment one, experiment two, experiment three. Let's say I just did experiment number one where the concentration of lycopodium powder or A was 0.10 moles per liter. The initial is what I'm starting off with. That's what I put in at the beginning. The square brackets mean moles per liter or concentration. And we're talking about lycopodium powder, one of our reagents, A. The oxygen in there. I uh, went ahead and uh, said, hey, make a quick calculation based on nitrogen gas and such, and said this is somewhat reasonable. Concentration of B or oxygen is going to be 0.10 moles per liter. Now the rate is something that we'd measure somehow using a stopwatch or using some kind of a visual detection device. And the units here for the rate are going to be moles per liter, big M is moles per liter, per second. So I uh, went ahead and made a rough estimate here right in front that the rate of this reaction is 0.0112 moles per liter per second. The rate of the reaction. Think of the rate as being the speed. So if we want to go ahead and speed up this reaction, we would do something perhaps like increase the temperature, uh, lower the activation energy, increase the concentrations, and we can get the rate to increase, which is what we've done. In experiment number two, I do not have 0.1 and 0.1. I went ahead and made a very nice, very nice, simple change. Don't want funny numbers here. I just went ahead and doubled B. So our concentration of A is a control. It's unchanged. It's 0.1. We would go ahead and double the concentration of B to 0.2. And in fact, look what's happened to the rate. The rate has doubled. Now let's go back to experiment one, which was 0.1 and 0.1 and take a look at experiment three now, you'll see that A has been doubled, but B is returned back to point one. So with experiment one and two, we've doubled B. With experiment one and three, B is held constant. We've doubled A. Look at the effect of uh, doubling A on our re reaction rate. It has not doubled. It has done something else. When we have a multiplier of four, we call it quadrupled. So what's happened is we've doubled A and we've quadrupled our rate, which is big money for the chemist. This is a good return saying, you know, if I double B, I might expect to double the speed. But here I've gone ahead and doubled A, quadrupled the speed. Nice mechanism there. So time is money. That's a nice payoff. Let's take a look at some arrows on this. We'll take a look at doubling B from reaction one and two. And the effect is? The rate doubles. When we double A, the rate quadruples over here. We can put this together and summarize by what's known as a rate law. The rate law is going to be like a shorthand notation for all of this concept. We'll say that the rate, which is over there given as experiment one, experiment two, or experiment three values, the rate is equal to some little constant, k, and that's our same k that we used earlier in the natural log of a over a naught is equal to minus kt, our constant, times the concentration of a, I'm going to leave some space, times the concentration of b, and I left space between the A and the B to put an exponent, which is going to reflect the order of the reaction with respect to A. I didn't need to leave space. Automatically, there's space provided for an exponent after B because it's at the end of this rate law. Now, back to what happens when we go ahead and double A. When we double A, the rate goes up by a factor of four. It quadruples. That's a squared effect back with our background math here. Think of this as being the number one at the beginning. One squared is one. But when we double and make with one into a two and square it, we don't have a two here. We get a four. It's a squared effect. And so we say that that is second order with respect to A. When we double A, the return is not double the rate. It's double squared, or four times the rate. Very nice. That's the big money. For uh, B, we're going to look at experiments one and two, and we double B, and the rate doubles. I'm going to put a one here. That's first order with respect to B. 
Mm, the term first order, take a look at our power over here. Put in anything to the first power is going to be that return of anything. So if we double, we double. And there it is. Let's make some notes underneath this. This is our rate law. K is going to be our constant. A has square brackets. It's the concentration of A to the second power. We make a little arrow to this and say this is going to be called second order with respect to A. And then, of course, the note here for the one is going to be first order with respect to B. You can take a look at the rate law and say, hey, I want the rate to speed up greatly, so I'm going to double A and the effect is going to be quadrupling the rate. There's a little novel idea here that textbooks usually like to point out, and that is something called the overall order. Overall order. And it's not very detailed. It's not telling us the detail that we have in our rate law. But the overall order is to add up our orders. These are the reactants, A and B. Each one has an order. So we're simply going to say the overall order is going to be 2 plus 1 or 3. The overall order for this reaction is 3. Again, not very detailed. If somebody said to you the overall order is 3, what should I do? You're not sure which uh, A or B might be uh, second order. You're not sure what's going on. You can also have a zero order reaction. A zero order reaction would occur when you go ahead and double one of the components, one of the reactants like A or B, and you actually find out that there's no change in the rate. What would that look like? Well, perhaps if you obtain data that look like this. Reaction number one, reaction number three have the same rates. And so we take a look. We've doubled A, and it's had no effect on our rate. So A is a zero order. We would reflect that by writing something like this. For our new problem, I've gone ahead and indicated that A is zero order. You double A, no change on the rate. So this, too, that's not right anymore. We've changed. That would be a zero, and zero order with respect to A. You could change A all you want. It's not going to change the rate. That's not very good. As far as the chemist is concerned, there's no money there thinking, I could go ahead and waste lots of A. It's not going to change the rate, and of course, time is money.